Hello there, I'm Derek Fournier and welcome to Plain Spoken, a podcast where we get real about business, leadership, and life. I've spent years in the trenches of leadership and team building, and now I'm bringing those conversations out into the open. We're going to talk strategy, dissect success, and maybe share a few laughs along the way. Each episode, I'll be joined by fascinating guests, from successful CEOs to brilliant minds shaking up their industries. We're here to offer you insights, challenge your perspectives, and ignite your curiosity. So whether you're a seasoned professional or just starting out, there's something here for you. Join me on this journey of exploration as we make sense of the complex world of business, one conversation at a time. Let's dive into today's episode of Plain Spoken. Welcome back to Plain Spoken, everyone. This is Derek Fournier, and I'm all by myself today, as I talked about a little bit uh, in my efforts to try and get back to the grassroots of podcasting. And again, a big thank you to my friend Pankaj, who who kind of brought up uh, my history in sports podcasting and the fact that I could cross over into uh, what I guess we would consider business podcasting, worky podcasting, whatever. But the thing that I didn't go back to was the consistency and and podcasting and posting really seems to 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 demand that and and for good reason. So uh, this first in a series of six, which are going to be my jump start as I try and build this new habit, is really focused on uh, leadership in times of crisis. So I published a blog this week, which hopefully you saw on plain site.net, uh, also posted across to LinkedIn uh, about this topic. And, and I want to I want to set the stage before we go into the required list of things you have to remember, because that seems to be a format that everyone likes, that crisis just is. There's always crisis. Crisis is really, a, a it's, it's a intensity uh, measurement. So it's really just change, change that scares people. Uh, and so whether that crisis is a global crisis, and I'll talk a little bit about that because you know there were obviously some things that all of us faced during the pandemic that we had never faced before and, and hopefully will not have to face again, or it could be a massive change in your market. It could be a medical challenge that isn't a pandemic. It affects the entire globe. But when you have change that is amplified to a level that affects your whole organization, it is another true test of good leadership. And there are some basic blocking and tackling is a phrase I use all the time uh, that, that I think you can incorporate into your standard operating procedures that will allow you to handle crisis more in stride. And the reason I can say in stride is because like I said, it's really just change amplified. So uh, that's what we're gonna get into today. And I'm gonna try and use some some tech here for the folks who watch us on YouTube, I'm using a different camera, which means I'm not looking you in the eye, but I think that the quality is better. If you're on audio, you're like, why is he babbling about that? And you don't even care. But we are actually going to have some visual aids here. So if you're listening to the audio, I've got an agenda because that's what all professionals do, uh, according to the books. We're going to talk about five key steps. And these were outlined in the uh, blog article as well. The first one is making decisive actions. Um, the next is about clear communication. And communication is one that you know pervades everything. Your communication ability is going to directly, it's not only correlate with success, it will cause uh, success. Strong, clear communication. It's not going to be perfect, um, but you've got to make sure communication sort of, uh, it goes through everything that you do. The third one, which often gets overlooked, uh, sadly, is empathy and support. And this is one that, I don't know that I'd say I I learned late in my career, but I certainly uh, learned a focus on it late in my career. But we'll talk about that, especially on the back end of the decisive actions and the clear communications. And followed, uh, following em- empathy and support, we're going to have the concept of uh, embracing adaptability and where that comes into managing in times of crisis. It also kind of harkens back to a core uh, core competency back from my old Microsoft days from a thousand years ago uh, and one that I've carried forward because I thought it was one that was really, really strong, which was the ability to deal with ambiguity. Uh, and then finally, on this particular topic, we'll talk about long-term vision. And the long-term vision will actually loop back into your clear communication as well. So with that said, we're going to launch right into making decisive actions. Um, When you're faced with what you have perceived as a crisis, and again, it could be a massive crisis because you use the word crisis. It could be any sort of change. Um, It's important for you to lean into and lean onto 
your leadership team. Uh, it, it should not be a cult of one. I know if you're a solopreneur, you are in fact a cult of one. So they make your, your decisions a little bit easier. So we'll, we'll take that one off the table since it's a bit of an edge case uh, in this discussion. But when you're leading a team, you're not leading them by yourself, right? So the people that you trust, whether they're, let's say you're the chief executive officer and you've got your C-suite, uh, it doesn't matter anywhere in the organization, you're gonna have a team of people that either by title or by trust are your cohort, which has become the word of, of this month that would appear. You're gonna wanna get with those folks and evaluate uh, the change that you are perceiving as a crisis. You're gonna to wanna to do it as systematically as possible and um, sort of as objectively as possible. You wanna try and pull emotion out as much as you can as you're evaluating what your options are to deal with it. Now, uh, an example uh, that, that is often meant or that's often shared is Spotify, I handled crisis very well during, uh, during COVID as well as Zoom. Uh, and those are two that I referenced in the in the blog article, but but I'm going to take one that's a little more personal because I was involved with it when when I was running uh, my previous company, DeCurtis Corporation. We serviced primarily the cruise industry, hospitality writ large, but we re- re- the the tip of our spear was cruise. And as you can imagine, while COVID had dramatic effects on the entire world, and certainly more dramatic than stopping someone's ability to to take a cruise, that entire industry for the first time in history was stopped. This is an industry that runs 24-7, 365. These giant floating hotels don't come out of service, but once every five to seven years for a dry dock. And so for that whole industry to grind to a halt was astonishing. Now, imagine if you were a company who derived, I don't know, upwards of 85% of your revenue from that industry driving and running. So then you're faced with, well, what do we do to keep the lights on while the world deals with this pandemic and while you know, industry returns to whatever we're going to call normal again. So our leadership team had to get together and evaluate what it was we could do, where our skills were, where our talent was. And the first thing we did was was look to our people. How could we make sure that they felt safe and secure, that we were, we were going to build a plan that we could work through? And so we tried to communicate relatively quick, quickly with our team to acknowledge the current state of affairs in the world. We had already moved uh, to, we had already been in, we didn't move to, we were already a remote work company. So the change in work environment wasn't that dramatic for us, though our primary development center in Jaipur, India, um, you know, we made sure that people knew they did not need to come into the office. We would allow them to work from wherever. Uh, we did, however, keep the office up. Some of the staff that was there who maintained the office, uh, it was a larger building, um, there wouldn't be density enough to cause a problem. And as long as it was legal for them to come into the office, we want to make sure they knew that they still had gainful employment. So we we kept up our infrastructure. We made sure that people felt safe and secure while we went and planned, what can we do to then take care of our customers? Our customers who know they owe us money for the products that we provide, but they're not making money. They're going to be concerned. What can we do using the technology stack that we had brought to bear to potentially speed recovery for them, to make this safer for a return to normalcy, whatever that was going to be? And to make a, a long story shorter than, than it could be, we ended up building a new product um, to help with temperature divination. Uh, divination is a pretty heavy handed word, but it was about getting an accurate temperature reading through a kiosk using some really interesting mathematics and, and really good hardware. Um, I think I can best summarize it by saying we built the Mercedes Benz of kiosk based temperature determination. Now, that was cool. We ended up with, I think, two patents. As a result of that, we sold a fair number of these uh, to a number of people uh, who were trying to open up their physical plants uh, sooner um, and to do so in a safer fashion as temperature was a leading indicator early on in the pandemic. Again, we were operating under the best information that we had at the time. We had smart people. We had an incredibly talented team uh, in security and surveillance uh, who knew cameras and technology really, really well. And we blended them together with our development team Everyone worked aggressively. We knew that we could use that product in our core market and we could potentially uh, straddle into adjacent markets. And most importantly, ideally generate revenue to keep everyone afloat until we could get back to the business that we did. Once we made that decision that that was gonna be our focus, that we were gonna make sure that our people were okay, that our clients were, our co were okay, and that we had a plan that could potentially generate revenue in a gap that we couldn't discern the length of from that point. We then moved from the decisive action of this is what we're going to do to the next step, 
which was clear communication. We needed to tell our team and our clients what we were going to do. So ideally, our clients would become clients of this too. They needed to know what was going on. We were going to want their feedback. And I will go on countless tirades and diatribes about the importance of customer feedback in the development cycle. And I know there are many of you out there who think you have the vision for the perfect product and you know what your customers need more than they do. I'm here to tell you you're wrong. I promise you you're wrong. And if you would just take some time, that doesn't mean you have to have them tell you everything, but you definitely need their perspective. Uh, do not be as arrogant as I have been in my past as to think that I know what's better for my customers without ever even asking them. But I digress. The clear communication was, here's what we're going to do, right? Here's why we're doing it. We're doing it to make sure that we have, uh, that we're participating in a way out of this in so much as we can, uh, and that we're doing so by helping our, our clients, by, by moving forward, by building our technology stack, increasing value in our company in so much as we can in this downturn. Um, we, we were clear about the who, who's going to work on what, um, what the timeline was, what the criticality was, but most importantly, the why. We, we really, and not to hearken again to Simon Sinek, who I'm deeply engrossed in uh, currently, apparently I was about three years later than everyone else on that one, but why did it matter? Why did it matter to help? Why did it matter to pivot a little bit uh, into this adjacent technology? Why was that good for everyone? And what was interesting is all of our people were, like everyone was at the time, you know, staying at home and following the rules of whatever country they happen to live in. We were a multinational uh, country. We sent out, you know, care packages and like movie night stuff and some swag with our stuff. And we really felt like we were trying to make a difference. And, and that, that mattered. It kept everyone together when everything else was so scary. We, you know, like I said, we had a large contingent in India. We were a lot of a lot of people who lost family members during this process that we knew about and to see what was normal there versus normal here was incredible. So communicating clearly to the entire organization, what was going on to our clients, what was going on and then to the market, what was going on was critical for us. Now we were an upstart there. And as it turns out, you know, we didn't really make much of a dent in the market. We built a product that we were incredibly proud of sold enough to, to keep afloat during this period of time, but we didn't change the world. But we did change the world for everyone on our team who we were able to keep gainfully employed during this process, um, which really takes us uh, to the next uh, to the next slide. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube with me, um, which is empathy and support. This one is a really easy case, I think, and so I want to use it as uh, an example because it is easy. We can tie into emotion with this because it was so dramatic, because it's still so much of the sort of common lexicon. We still talk about the pandemic. In fact, my wife's uh, uncle and aunt were over for a wonderful dinner last night and we hadn't seen them in a while. And, and it's still a topic of conversation uh, as a, a pandemic would be. But make no mistake in anything that you deem as a crisis or any set of change that is significant, people are going to have a fear response. Now that's that's generally going to start from confusion. Uh, they're, what they hope would happen or what they envision to happen is not happening in the world, whether it's uh, we don't have as many clients as we thought we'd have, our, our calls are down, whatever it is, right? They start to get worried. And when fear creeps into any equation, leadership really has to find their empathy skill set and realize what it looks like to everyone else in the organization. And if you don't have that, if you can't do the, the visualization to try and project what this might look like to someone else, then ask them, go talk to them, be a human. We have so many ways to communicate with each other. And sadly, we take advantage of almost none of them on a regular basis. And, and maybe, maybe, I don't know, you know, I'm doing this unscripted and apologies for the background noise. My chair is squeaky, but. Maybe it's because leadership is oftentimes scared of vulnerability. And I've talked about vulnerability in the blog a number of times. I've talked about it on this podcast a lot of times. Anyone who doesn't think that their people understand that they're a human too is wrong. And if you think that that makes you stronger, you're wrong. Your humanity is, in fact, what, what can be the differentiator and what creates bonds on teams. When, when I look back at the company that I, that I ran prior to, to doing this podcast and working with Plainsight, the thing that I miss the most is the people. I miss the relationships. I miss the friendships, not just with my team, uh, both here and abroad, but with our clients, 
with our partners, the ecosystem, right? It was, it's really an incredible thing when you're allowed to, when you allow yourself to uh, look beyond the PL and look to the human side of all of these things. Because I assure you, it's the human side that will carry everything forward through all of our times of trouble. And, and Lord knows we had plenty of times of trouble that were not tied to COVID. Um, it was the relationships that made things work. So tap into that empathy piece. Uh, and I know that emotional intelligence uh, has become more of a topic lately, which is good. I think it's really important. I, I sucked at it for years. And to be honest, working at Microsoft back in the late 90s, early 2000s, wasn't a great place to learn any concept of empathy. It was a great place to learn a lot of stuff. And I, and I, for years, I thought that I learned more at Microsoft than I ever did in school. And I know that there are people out there that are Apple people or open source people who are like, Microsoft sucks. I get it. And we can, we can throw rocks at each other or whatever. But the reality was I loved being able to walk through the halls at 2.30 in the morning and see people in conference rooms solving problems, not because they were told to, but because they wanted to solve them, because they had a group of smart folks and they wanted to solve an issue. That passion was awesome. The fact that you could attack problems with a viciousness that was incredible. I loved that. But I realized that once you got out of those walls, and to be honest, even within those walls now, I haven't worked at Microsoft since 2003. And I know that it has changed significantly in the two plus decades that I've been gone and, and probably should have changed, right? Not all that stuff that I liked was good at scale. But the one thing that was not really present as far as a cultural or a company maxim or mentality was one of empathy. There was individual demonstration of empathy like there is anywhere, but that wasn't something we did. So later in life, as, as I learned these lessons over time, I have really tried to lean into vulnerability and empathy to make sure that you're evaluating. Because when we, when we do step one, when we're trying to take decisive action, make the decision about how you're going to address the crisis, you need to do that objectively because you need to try and figure out what is the best path out with the highest likelihood of success. But then you have to pull subjectivity into it and use empathy to figure out what is that going to do to everyone who it impacts, right? And, and then work that into your communication model and make sure that you are leaning into that at all areas. Because just because you feel that you have articulated a clear and sound direction or you and your team is a better way to articulate that actually, doesn't mean that everyone's going to understand it. And so taking the time to help people understand the whys that you have tried to articulate. Uh, filling those communication gaps is critical. And, and I think that by connecting to the human side of the equation, you can do that far better. The next step is embracing adaptability. And this is where it comes into the fact that uh, no matter how good your plan is, it's probably not perfect. <laughs> so, you know, we spent all that time with our, our cohort to, to come up with this great plan of action. And we're gonna move forward. And then you start moving forward and you realize, ah, shit, uh, we totally, we totally mucked this up. This isn't going to work for us. And for us, um, we realized that our price point was just too high. There were plenty of products that were out on the market. Uh, they didn't do as good a job, which is what we were leaning on. Um, but this is one of those things where we made a mistake that I think a lot of us make. And, you know, there are plenty of reasons we made the mistake. I'm not beating us up. Um, we tried to sell people what we believed they needed, not what they wanted. We thought they needed incredibly accurate, fast temperature determination at a safe distance that could be integrated simply into their processes. Um, we did not take into consideration uh, cost as a comp or as a comparison, a market comp, because there were a ton of ways to do this that were more, air quotes, dangerous. Uh, handheld thermometers or temperature thermometers, right? Um, but what it came down to is, and this is one of those things that I'm not going to go off on this diatribe too far either. And I've used diatribe too often in this podcast probably, but um, if you're in the safety market, health and safety market, one thing I've noticed, because we spent a long time in that. In fact, the entire time I was with the Curtis, we had the leading mustering uh, software on the market. What I found out in this, again, not attacking anyone, well, I guess I am sort of attacking people. Um, I'll, I'll wear that. People claim they care about health and safety until they have to pay for it. So if you're doing health and safety, which is what we were doing, you better damn well start knowing that they're not going to want to pay a premium for it. They're going to want to pay as little as possible because it does not drive revenue. So 
we we screwed that up pretty badly. Um, and while we did enough for that to have been successful enough, and we felt we had built good technology and we'd done a good job for our clients, it was not a long tail product. So we had to adjust. We had to make modifications. And that requires you to be able to go back with uh, honesty and openness to say, well, this was our plan. And now we're going to adjust our plan. We're going to adapt our plan. And then you cycle right back into your communication model. Um, now, I, I teased this a little bit at the beginning of this podcast by talking about uh, the core competency, which was dealing with ambiguity. And, and I know that this can be another one of those double-edged swords, or as my friend Carlos Vidalas said in his incredibly charming uh, accent, it is much like a knife with two edges, both of which are sharp. Um, if you're always in an air of ambiguity, most people don't do well. Most human animals like to have some clarity, some understanding of what it is they're expected to do, what good looks like, et cetera. There are some animals out there who are change junkies, and I'm sort of a change junkie, so change doesn't bother me much. So the, the word crisis almost kind of rolls off my back a little bit because I just think it's another kind of change. But I'm not so stupid or arrogant as to think that that's how everyone operates, nor am I stupid or arrogant enough to believe that that's how you should operate all the way. It's just how I seem to be wired. So while you embrace adaptability, you acknowledge that you are fallible, you know that no plan is perfect, the communication and the empathy are going to save you here. And they should. If you communicated clearly the first time, you can always go back and communicate the change the second time. If you did so from a position of empathy and support, the empathy and support will follow you to the second time. If anything, it'll be a magnifier or an amplifier to that empathy and support. It is the fact that you are listening to the market or listening to the environment, listening to whatever you need to listen to, and willing to make changes, right? This is not a hill you want to die on that you made a change and by God, this is what we're going to do moving forward. You have to be able to and willing to make changes uh, and you have to embrace that. And by the way, when you do that, you can actually come up with great ideas. The subtext here on the slide that you can't see in the podcast is adaptability can lead to innovative solutions. And it can, when you make an adjustment, and it was interesting, one of the other products we had was with a, a company called Virgin Voyages. And uh, for various reasons that I won't get into, originally there was going to be a wearable that would be used to uh, locate them, locate sailors, which is what guests were. It could also do crew. Um, and you were going to be able to shake for champagne. It's going to find you via the wearable. Because of a, a challenge that we faced in the market, we had to switch to have the phone app do that. And listen, I, I will also talk ad nauseum about why I don't like using a phone for things like this because of the burden and tax that it puts on your guests or your users. But we were open to that change. We adapted, we made the change and it launched and it continues to be used to this day successfully on that client's uh, software platform. So in that particular case, we even knew we could go that way and chose explicitly not to go that way for a number of good reasons. But because we had a change hit during the process, we had to be willing to make an adjustment. We had to go talk to our internal teams and say, hey, I know that we all think this is the wrong direction to go from a tech vision perspective, but we have to make a change. So here's how we're going to do it. Here's how we're going to make it the best we can for our clients. So let's go march forward and do it this way. We had to talk to our clients and, and, and show them that, hey, listen, we understand we've got to make this change because of some external stimulus. And here's how we're going to do it to make it the best it can be for, for you and for your guests, in this case, people known as sailors, and how it can be best for the business. So being willing to know that a plan is just a vector, right? And that you can adjust, whether it's, and I'll, I'll go all nautical, whether it's the wind or the tide, sometimes you have to make adjustments to get to your end point. And when you tether that with a uh, empathetic foundation and a spirit of true communication, there's really nothing that you can't accomplish as a leadership team but more importantly, as an overall team, as an overall organization, those leaders are the ones that are simply, uh, you know, trimming the sails and adjusting the rudder and making the changes and course corrections as necessary uh, and making sure that everything gets communicated out to the rest of the team, whether that team is internal or external. The last piece is a long term vision. So if you're always making these little changes, you might end up in the middle of nowhere. So if you if you have a North Star, 
that lets you know where it is you're trying to go, what it is you're trying to accomplish, then all of those other sub decisions will be rooted in that as the goal. And it will lessen the amount of confusion that will be instilled in your organization when you make those sort of micro adjustments. And sometimes they're not micro, sometimes they're significant adjustments. We had no intention of building a temperature kiosk when we set out uh, to build the platform that we were building in the market we were building it in. We just had a bunch of smart people. We knew there was a problem. We worked with the other smart people on our team, saw an issue, went and addressed it. But our long-term vision was to service our, our hospitality clients, most specifically were the ones in cruise. And when it came to the pandemic, which was our big pivot point, like it was for so many people, it was to help uh, keep our people safe, keep our clients alive, functional, and move forward to whatever normal looks like in, a, in the safest possible way. Provide value however we could to get back to where we were. That was the long-term vision. We didn't have any sort of grandstanding ideals of changing the world one passenger at a time or anything like that. We definitely did have some mission, vision, and goal stuff around making the world a better place, but that's, that's too mushy right there. What our vision was during this time frame was stay safe and alive, stay economically viable and as healthy as possible, help our clients reemerge, because if our clients reemerged, safely and healthy, it would flow through the rest of the organization. So that was sort of our North Star. So any of those changes we made, as long as they were in line with that long-term vision, didn't cause a tremendous amount of upset or uh, confusion. And I'll go into a little bit of a confusion uh, sidebar here, because uh, I was fortunate enough to work with a company uh, called Talentism. In fact, I had Trevor Hunter from Talentism on this podcast a few podcast episodes ago, and he was my coach. Um, one of the core pieces of their IP, one of the things that drives their coaching practice, and one of the reasons why I gravitated to them, I know there are thousands of methodologies for coaching out there, and you have to find the one that you like the best. This one happened to be the one I liked, uh, are there three C's. And, and at the foundation there is, um, we, are, we all live in a state of confusion. I'm sure there's a musical drop I could put in here that would be good for production value. Confusion happens when our expectations don't are not met by reality. We expect a, a behavior and we don't get that behavior. And then when we are confronted with that confusion, we have two choices. We, are either, we either fall into what's called certainty, where we are certain that this is why. We draw conclusions. And, and we all do this. It, it doesn't make you a bad person. But the more you're aware of this, and, and, I, and I'd encourage you as a podcast listener or viewer, to, to look in your life and the things that are causing you stress or concern or frustration and see if you can start finding these areas of confusion where, where your expectations are not being met with reality. And then one of the things that I did all the time, and I have no problem, I, I think I talked about this a little bit with Trevor as well, is you can fall into a, what they call BSL narratives or bad, stupid, lazy narratives where you say, well, um, this person didn't respond to my email in a timely enough fashion because they, they're an asshole. Or, um, they didn't buy my product because they just don't understand. They're stupid. Um, or uh, they're, they're lazy. They just don't, they don't care, right? And while any of those three may in fact be true, right? <laughs> this is an important uh, point. And Trevor may disagree with me. And I encourage Trevor, if you listen to this podcast and you do disagree, we'll have you back on and we'll talk about it. But they're not likely the primary reason, right? As, as humans, we, we fall into these things almost instinctually, we are certain that this is the answer. And, and a better path, I would assert, and certainly talentism asserts and, and taught me, and, and it worked out well for me, I believe. I think I became a much better leader uh, through their coaching, was we wanted to get to clarity. And, and the path to clarity, and, and clarity here means a real understanding of why we were confused. Why did our expectations not get met with reality? What was the disconnect? So to get there, you design experiments. And it sounds like I've got, you know, beakers and test tubes and all that sort of stuff. And in some ways, you kind of do. Um, it's funny, the, the folks on the podcast can't see this. I am in total UCF regalia today. I've got my UCF uh, athletic shirt on and my UCF dad mug. Super proud of my son, Nicholas. He made the UCF snare line as a freshman. So we're very excited. So apologies to you guys who are watching this or going, my God, is UCF a sponsor of this podcast? No, they're not. But 
At any rate, you design experiments to try and figure out why you were confused. And that can be communication processes. It can, it can be talking to peers to, uh, to get a third person view of the scenario. Maybe it's a conflict with a superior. Maybe it's a conflict with a peer. Maybe it's a confusion in the market. Uh, maybe it's uh, someone you're trying to communicate with who's being incredibly slow and, and you know that they need the thing you're trying to get them and, and you can't quite figure out why it is they're not reaching back out to you. Talk to the people you know in common. Design an experiment to figure out what the real root cause is. But I would caution you all to not fall into that uh, certainty trap. And one of the things that can help you with this is to make sure you understand what the long-term vision is um, and keep that looped into your entire organization. So um, at this point, we're going to do a closing call to action. You can see the little fancy uh, slide on my video presentation. This is the first one of these that is not plain and simple where I do it by myself, where it's more of a uh, quick thought. Again, thanks to Pankaj for, for kicking me in the backside and making me do this. Also, not that he'll hear this, but uh, Alan Weiss, who's a million-dollar consultant, a fantastic and prolific author. I attended a seminar his the other day. And he does a couple things. He does like a minute with Alan. He does every day. And then he, he has this uh, schedule. And I'm trying to a, a adjust and get a schedule as well. But my call to action here is, first, let's, uh, let's soften the word crisis. Um, I have, I have an underlying belief that we have a tendency to be a bit melodramatic with our language. And I love the language. Um, there are people who are far better at it than I am. But I, I do love the language. We, we use the word friend too easily, and Facebook is largely responsible for that in recent times. Um, we use crisis too often. It's okay. You're painting a picture. But the first step is, is this really a crisis? Or is it just the next challenge that you need to face? And life is all about challenges. And as a leader, effective leadership in times of crisis, right, demands the same basic blocking and tackling that is demanded every single day. You just need to take that same rigor and discipline and apply it here and realize that the stakes could be higher because everyone's emotional temperature gauge can be higher. The concern level, the confusion level in your organization can be, can be higher. And so the stakes are going to be higher as you make any adjustments or course corrections based on what is perceived as a crisis. So I hope you guys enjoyed this podcast. Uh, this was a, a, a fun new format that I'm going to try and do uh, every two weeks. At least we're going to have a podcast coming out here. Um, if you did enjoy it, let me know. If you didn't, let me know. The way to, to get in touch with us is really through LinkedIn. That's the social media platform that, that I have sort of focused on while we do have a Twitter or X account. We don't use it very much for anything. Um, but it's easy to find us on LinkedIn under Plainsight Strategy Group. I'm easy to find uh, Derek Fournier. Uh, and again, if you haven't subscribed to this, certainly would appreciate it. Share it with your friends if you find value in it. And if there are topics you'd like us to cover, or if you think that you'd be a good guest to come on here and talk about something, or if you think that I'm full of shit and you want to argue with me about something, that's fine too. What I would love to do is over time, get this to the point where it's, uh, it's followed by consumed by whatever uh, verb you want to use enough people that we could do some live events as well. Uh, when I did sports, uh, podcasting. That was my favorite part was to have the live shows where you had people in the chat room and you could actually have dialogue because one of the things that we've seen uh, sort of go the way of the dinosaur, if you believe they ever existed, which I hope you do, um, is true good faith dialogue. Differing opinions brought to a conversation where compromise is perceived as both sides can still win they don't have to win everything. At some point in the last 12 to 22 years, we seem to have lost faith in that. Certainly, we've lost sight of it. Uh, I have not, and I hope that we can try and find it again. So thanks for joining the podcast. Thanks so much for tuning into another episode of Plain Spoken. I hope today's conversation sparked some new ideas and left you with a few takeaways to ponder or implement in your own journey. If you enjoyed the show, found value in our dialogue, I'd be really grateful if you could hit the subscribe button. Sharing this podcast with your network helps us grow and continue to bring you insightful and engaging content. Don't forget, you can find us on LinkedIn and a few other social platforms. Follow us, interact with our posts, and join the Plain Spoken community. Your thoughts, feedback, and ideas are what keep this conversation going. So please drop us a line or leave us a comment. 
Thanks again for joining me, Derek Fournier, on Plain Spoken. Keep an eye out for our next episode, and until then, keep growing. What the, what the, what the, what the, what the.